So I came without a jacket, figuring I'm getting ready for the heat wave that's coming. Uh, I, I would rather be the uh, half full rather than half empty type of guy. And I never use the word old. Uh, I tell people when they ask how old I am, I say, uh, well, I'm just less young than I used to be. I'm not getting OLD. That's a three-letter word. So anyway, it is really good to be with you here this morning. And uh, we're trusting God will do something in the hearts of all of you who are here today. Now, I imagine that most of you have home improvement stories that you can tell. Yes? I'm sure you do. Well, a while back, I came across a true story of home, about a home improvement project that I think uh, you will get a kick out of. A homeowner decided he was going to add a deck to the back of his house. So he started by digging a series of holes for the concrete post supports. I mean, you know they need supports in the ground. He lived in New Hampshire, so he wanted to make sure that the foundation got below the frost line, so he had to dig the holes eight feet deep. Using a hand digger, he would lay on the ground as the hole got deeper so he could reach down in to keep you know, picking up, pulling out the dirt. And uh, it was all he could do to get down to eight feet. As he worked on the third hole, it began to rain. And in fact, it began to rain hard. He got soaked. But he was determined he was going to finish before he put his tools away. So he kept on digging, and he was digging the final hole when all of a sudden the water-soaked ground gave way as he had been leaning in to reach down, and he slid headfirst down into the hole that he was digging. The only thing that showed of him was his feet. They were sticking up out of the hole, so he's face first, feet up in the air. He began calling for his wife frantically for someone to come and help him so he could get out of the hole. But as he was yelling for his wife, dirt kept falling into his mouth. And as time progressed, water began to fill up the hole. And the water was getting very, very close to his face, so he was worried about being able to breathe. About a half hour went by, and all of a sudden, he felt hands on both of his feet, and he felt himself being lifted up out of the hole. As he got out of the hole, he was standing there face to face with a group of firemen who were laughing hysterically. His wife had heard his calls for help, and she called the fire department. They came in, and they lifted him out. Uh, there is a moral to the story that I want to pass along to you this morning. It's this. If you don't do things the right way, you could end up with mud in your face. So keep that in mind. If you don't do things the right way, you can end up with mud on your face. We have some churches in our conference that are not as healthy as we'd like them to be. They gather for worship on Sundays. They enjoy friendship of uh, other people in their church. They have dinners and other seasonal events. But they're no longer making disciples by reaching out into the community and sharing Christ with people. They may not want to admit it, but some of those churches are in critical condition. So how do you know if a church is really in critical condition? Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? What would be some criteria? I'm sure you have some that you think of right away. But let me share just a few. When a church is in trouble, leaders in, are in the process of losing their passion for Christ. Rather than talking about ministry, they talk about buildings and budgets. Church attendance seems to be consistently declining you know, I read just recently that the churches that have been stable for years, you know, they, they reach a, a place and they plateau and the, the attendance is steady. Uh, since the pandemic is over, that's beginning to change. Churches that have been steady are now either growing or they're beginning to decline. But if church attendance is declining, you know instinctively things aren't good. For churches that are in trouble, the finances are always in the red. There just isn't enough money coming in to meet the monthly expenses of keeping the church operating. A church is in trouble if there is zero involvement in the community. I mean, I've heard people ask the question, if the church closed tomorrow, would anybody in the neighborhood even notice? We need to connect to the neighborhood. And one more thing I'd list as a sign that the church is in trouble 
is that the focus is on keeping members rather than reaching new people. And basically, they've given up on evangelism. We do have churches that are in trouble. I wish we didn't, but we do. Churches that are in danger need to experience renewal. What is renewal? The dictionary defines it as filling something with new life and new energy. God gave the prophet Ezekiel a beautiful vision of what renewal looks like. Because you would call perhaps that Ezekiel had a vision of a valley of dead, sun-bleached, lifeless bones. And God's Spirit made them all come together and come back to life. Church renewal is just like that. It is the act of filling a church with a renewed focus on its mission so that it can once again grow and fulfill the purpose for which God created it. And let's be sure, it takes a lot of work to make a church healthy once again. The book of 2 Chronicles, where we're going to look this morning, tells us about Hezekiah, who became the king of Judah uh, at the age of just 25 years old. Nice young man, smart, intelligent, ready to take the job. He inherited the throne from his father, King Ahaz. Now, if you remember some of your Old Testament history, you'll recall that Ahaz was a bad king who did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. He made images of Baal, and he worshipped them. He practiced pagan religious rituals and even sacrificed his own children in fires. When he was king of Judah, as you might suspect, the temple was completely neglected, and eventually it was closed. So when Hezekiah became the king, he decided he wanted to change all that and change it as quickly as possible. He wanted to restore the temple. He wanted to restore the worship of God himself. And as we examine Hezekiah's efforts, I think we see a pattern that we can utilize in church renewal. Hezekiah evaluated the situation, and then he chose a starting point. He started by repairing the things in the temple that were broken and getting rid of all the things that had gathered in there that didn't belong there anymore. So the first step we're going to find as we turn to the Scripture now will be that we must repair what's broken. In 2 Chronicles, I'm looking here at uh, chapter 29, verse 3, the Bible says, In the very first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord, and repaired them. Hezekiah started the whole process by repairing the doors to the temple, which were broken. It makes sense when you consider that nobody could get into the building because the doors were broken. I guess difficult to, off the hinges, just could not work them. So it's a perfect place to start. And uh, in addition to that, he had to fix the tables, the lampstands, and all the other items that were there in the temple so that they could resume the worship of God. Now, he said about fixing the things that were in the temple, and we obviously don't have the lampstands and the tables and all the stuff that they had back then. But there are things that we may need to fix, things that need to be repaired in our churches when our churches are struggling for health. We need to renew some of the items that are essential to worshiping and honoring God in our lives. For instance, Bible reading and study. We need to be listening to what God is saying, not just what other people around us are saying, but we need to hear the heart of God and His voice as He speaks. Perhaps we need to repair our prayer ministries. Prayer seems to be something that a lot of churches are lacking these days. But prayer is simply spending time in God's presence and seeking His help with our needs and the needs of other people. Maybe we need to uh, repair the fellowship in a church. and We, we need to uh, build deeper relationships with the other people that we know in the congregation where we meet. Maybe we need to... Uh, excuse me. Maybe we need to fix our giving. We need to make our resources available to the other people who are in need. Maybe we need to repair our service. You know, we need to show others the love of Jesus by performing acts of kindness for them uh, whenever we see the opportunity to do so. Maybe we need to repair our evangelism because it's broken down. We just need to get back to the task of telling other people about Jesus. These are the things, by the way, that every follower of Jesus Christ should be doing today. 
I think by definition that's what it means to be a disciple. We'll be reading our Bibles, praying and fellowshipping and giving and serving, and we'll be reaching other people with the gospel of Christ as opportunities present themselves. If the church's people are not doing those things, then an unhealthy church can never recover because they're the hallmarks, the foundation of a really healthy congregation. So we must repair the spiritual things that have been broken in our churches today. Second thing we need to do is remember what we have forgotten. Again, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 6 and 7 says, Our ancestors were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They abandoned the Lord in His dwelling place. They turned their backs on Him. They also shut the doors to the temple's entry room and they snuffed out the lamps. They stopped burning incense and presenting burnt offerings at the sanctuary of the God of Israel. You'll recall that it was the responsibility of the priests and the Levites to lead the people in worship. That was their sole purpose assigned by God. But it seems that they did what can happen so easily today. They lost track of what was most important, and they slowly began to neglect the very thing that God had called them to do. And I think that's what happens in some of our churches today. It becomes way too easy for us to drift off mission, to be distracted by things that look good, but aren't necessarily the priorities. And so when we drift off mission, we fail to do that which is most important. We can forget sometimes that while outreach, by outreach I mean getting to know other people and connecting with them in relationships, that while outreach is fine, introducing those people we get to know to Jesus is the highest priority. We want them to hear about our Savior. We can forget that the church isn't for us. Rather, it is for people who need the gospel. It used to be said, and some of you will remember this, it used to be said that the church is a hospital for sinners. That's still what it's supposed to be today. We can forget that our traditions are wonderful, but we need to stay relevant to younger generations. Truth never changes, but as the culture changes, the way we share that truth may need to change also so that people will understand our message has value to them as well. We want to use it to have an open door. And we forget that although we like the way we do things, and we do like the way we do things, I like the way I do them, but we can't let our preferences become the reasons that we struggle for growth. We have to always do what we can to make people outside of the faith feel comfortable and welcome when we gather together. The people forgot about the Lord's house and they turned their backs on God. When Hezekiah became the king, he set out to restore that which was forgotten. And he pointed out that the people had forgotten to stay committed to the holiness of God. The text says that they did what is evil. And isn't it so easy to just get caught up in something that pulls us away from a right relationship with God? He said that they forgot the Lord has to be first in their lives. This is what he said. They turned their backs on God. I don't think they literally walked away and had nothing, no thoughts about God. But God no longer had first place in their lives. He was pushed somewhere down the totem pole because other things were now considered to be more important. The people forgot to keep worshiping the Lord in his house every week. And that's why the Bible says they closed the temple. Not important anymore. Nobody seemed to miss it. They forgot to keep the house of God looking beautiful. They forgot to maintain a healthy relationship with God. And as a result, things were not going well. If there is to be renewal, we must remember and we must begin to do the things that we have forgotten, the things which are basic, the things which are priority and importance. Because if we don't, an unhealthy church will never get healthy again. Third thing we need to do is acknowledge the cost of turning away from God. Second Chronicles 29, verse 8 and 9, says, That is why the Lord's anger has fallen upon Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread, horror, and ridicule, as you can see with your own eyes. 
Because of this, our fathers have been killed in battle and our sons and daughters and wives have been captured. God's anger turned toward his own people. I sometimes fear that people think that there will be no consequences if we turn our back on God and walk away and pursue other things in life rather than him. And yet the Bible teaches very clearly that there are consequences for leaving God behind. Hezekiah pointed out that the wicked actions of the leaders and of the people had literally stirred up the anger of God against them. He had to withdraw his blessing from them. He had to withdraw his protection from them. And there were some severe consequences as a result. In the passage, he says that men had been killed in battle and their sons, daughters, and wives were captured by their enemies. Sounds like current news, doesn't it? He also said that Judah and Jerusalem became objects of dread, horror, and ridicule. No one was afraid of God's people, and they became targets. Because of the sins of the fathers, it says that they experienced God's wrath. You know, when I read that passage, the one word that stuck out, there were three of them there, dread, horror, and ridicule. You know, the one that caught my eye the most was ridicule. People taunted and made fun of them because they didn't see any reality to the things that they kept saying uh, were true. As it relates to our churches, I think we're seeing sometimes God, again, withdrawing his blessing, and we're seeing a bit of his anger because we're losing people, and we're losing influence in the community. There's where that word ridicule comes up again. I think many churches today are become uh, objects of scorn in the community. It saddens me to say that evangelical Christians in our culture at large are now being viewed as a political voting block rather than as sources of hope and healing. Isn't that what you hear in the news all the time? The evangelical vote is getting out. That's not what we're about. We're to be sources of healing and hope. Churches that are drifting away from God, I believe, have been grieving the Holy Spirit and failing to honor God. And because there's a cost to turning away from God, we've begun to pay the price. We must turn back to him and make him the highest priority of life if we are to be renewed, if we are to become spiritually whole and spiritually healthy again. Keep in the back of our minds always, there is a cost to drifting away from God. And the other thing that has to happen if we're going to have renewal in a church is that we must restore the commitment that has possibly fallen off to the wayside. Again, 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10 and 11. But now I will make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not neglect your duties any longer. The Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, and to lead the people in worship and present offerings to him. As soon as he ascended to the throne, Hezekiah's primary goal was to turn back the anger of God and to restore God's blessing upon the nation. He made a covenant with God. He committed to seek God with all his heart, soul, mind, strength, and being and to lead the people that he was leading to do the very same thing. He made it his goal to take that which was wrong and turn it into the right. There's an interesting context to all of this. Because it seems that as all this is taking place, King Sennacherib of Assyria was preparing to invade Judah. Hezekiah's first response to the threat was to commit his people to seeking the Lord. If Hezekiah had responded with military might, as you would expect most kings to do, the Assyrians would have understood that. And they would have met might, with might, they'd have matched army against army. And Judah may well have lost if they simply rolled up the roll call and gone to war. But the first thing Hezekiah did is call his people to begin to seek the Lord, to look to him first. And then after the people were looking to God, yes, he did go ahead and make military preparations because that was appropriate and proper. The primary was to seek the Lord first. And when the day of battle approached, Hezekiah encouraged the people, saying, 
Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria or his mighty army, for there is a power far greater on our side. He may have a great army, but they are merely men. We have the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles for us. Hezekiah knew very clearly that his commitment to seek God first opened the door to God's blessing so that people could be renewed and God's blessing could be put back on them. And with God's help, Judah won the battle. When church attendance declines, and it has in some churches, you know our first instinct is to do whatever we can to get the numbers back up. When we run short of money, our first instinct is to find new ways to bring in cash flow and revenue. We do yard sales and other things to keep the money on hand, and that's okay. But that ought not to be the first thing we do. The very first thing we need to do if we're to see renewal in our churches is to seek the Lord. He has got to be first. Do you remember the moral of our opening story? If you don't do things the right way, you can end up with mud in your face. So we can't just make bold promises and run out with our projects and plans. We have to be walking hand in hand with the Lord in everything that we do. Our first priority to experience renewal in any church, whether it be here in York or other churches I can uh, think of this morning, our first priority needs to be to seek the Lord. That's pretty simple, isn't it? We simply need to seek the Lord. Churches can become healthy again, but they will become healthy again only by the life-giving power of God's Holy Spirit. God is able to renew any church at any time, anywhere. Jesus is willing to renew any church, any time, anywhere. And the Holy Spirit is anxious for people in every church to seek Him and walk with Him again so that He can breathe new life into those churches. God is willing. Tom Cheney, who is a church renewal specialist, said this, we will never see renewal within the church until the people of God restore the things which have fizzled out in our spiritual walks so that we can get back to being right with God. I think being right with God is where the whole process started. When you came to Jesus and asked him to be your savior, your goal was to be right with God. And when we drift away, we have to go back to that same starting place where we simply get right with God. And that's what Hezekiah demanded of the priests and the Levites. He told them to purify themselves. Then he commanded them, do not neglect your duties any longer. The Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him and to lead the people in worship and present offerings to him. They were chosen to serve, and they needed to get to work. I guess sometimes other things distract us. Sometimes I think we get discouraged, and we start to adopt the attitude, why keep on? I'm putting in all this effort. I don't see much fruit for my labor. And, and, and then things begin to go downhill very quickly. Renewal starts with God. You can do it any other way you want, but it has to always start with God. Do you remember what Jesus said? Apart from me, you can do, you know the word? Nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we're going to see renewal, it has to start by seeking the Lord, him and him alone as our starting place. And as we seek the Lord, we're going to need to fix those things in our personal lives, in the life of our church that have broken down and are no longer functioning the way God intended them to function. We need to begin to focus on our mission again, which is not just, you know, bucks and bodies. We've got to be focusing on sharing Jesus with people out there who need to know him. I know everybody talks about what's going on in our country right now. Our culture seems to be just spiraling out of control. I want to tell you, the solution is not government. The solution is Jesus. If the church is busy sharing Christ with people out there who need to hear him, our culture can be completely changed and they become godly and whole and healthy once again. 
The church needs to focus on its mission. We are here first and foremost to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. And the other thing we need to do, sometimes some of us need to recommit to serving and honoring God in everything we do, in every way, at all times, as much as possible. We need to make that a commitment each and every day. We start the day, we have our devotions, we talk to God, we listen to Him, and we say, Lord, I'm going to commit this day to you because I want to honor you, I want to serve you, and I want you to use me today to make a difference in the community and the people that I know. So renewal can come but renewal comes by turning to God first, seeking Him, first and foremost, making Him Lord of life, not just the Savior, but also Lord. He is preeminent in everything. My prayer is that God will allow renewal to continue to happen here uh, in York. You have a long, rich history here in York, and uh, we want to see the ministry here continue to blossom. I know your pastor is doing a great job. He's does a lot of work. Um, you continue to support him. You continue to seek the Lord, and you pray, and God can and will make things happen. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you that with you all things are possible. We come before you and admit, Lord, that sometimes... Uh, We've lost sight of what's most important. We've been distracted by things that are good, but we've, we've lost sight of those things which are most important. And uh, we've allowed some of the things in our church uh, to break down. We've walked away from some of the most basic things because we think we need to do something else other than those basics. And uh, sometimes, Lord, we realize or sense that uh, things aren't going as well as we'd like. And we want to see our churches prosper and grow. And so today, Father, we come before you and confess that uh, we've let some things slide. We've uh, misaligned our priorities. And sometimes, Lord, we've taken a rather uh, defeated attitude. And so we tend not to give everything our best and we back off a bit just because we don't have the energy or desire to do that. Forgive us, Father, for our sin. Forgive us where we failed. Forgive us where we've drifted away. Forgive us where we've lost our enthusiasm. Forgive us, Lord, that uh, we are not honoring you in everything that we do. And we thank you that with you all things are possible. And so I pray, Father, that where renewal has to start, that it would start in each one of us. Because until we're revived, until we're renewed, we can't help to bring renewal to the congregation at large. So I pray, Father, today, meet us by your Holy Spirit. Convict us of things that need to change and change our hearts that we would be the kind of people you desire and intend us to be, people who love and honor you. And then I pray, Father, as we change, help us to change what's going on inside of our churches as well. That as we become alive, and on fire for Christ, that the people around us may also do the same thing. And I pray, Father, that you will bless uh, this congregation. I pray that you will bless the York Church with renewed fires of, of passion to serve you, that people will, will love you with all their heart, soul, mind, strength, and being, that they will serve you in every way they possibly can. And I ask, Father, that uh, this congregation will see men, women, and boys and girls coming to faith in Jesus Christ for the first time, that they would then see as they seek you, see their numbers increase, revenues increase, because they are making a difference on behalf of your kingdom. So thank you, Lord, uh, for what we can learn through Hezekiah. May that be the uh, blueprint for renewal in our lives and in our churches. We love and we thank you for all you've done for us and all that we anticipate in the days ahead as we seek you and pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.